For Inside Carolina, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and this is In the Trenches, where I'm joined by my fellow Carolina football letterman, Mike Ingersoll and EJ Wilson. Guys, we've been talking about the problems that this team has, and they all came to light Saturday in Keenan Stadium with Notre Dame winning 45-32. to It was a game that, to put it quite frankly, it, it humbled a, a 3-0 Tar Heel team and kind of exposed the team for, for what they are and what they potentially could be in the season. I think it kind of uh, dampered some expectations and, and reset some of the, um, the hopes that fans had for this team with Notre Dame kind of controlling that on both sides of the ball. Mike, let's start with you. What were your biggest takeaways from, that, from the game? Yeah, I, I think that some concerns we had were confirmed. Um, I think that some things we were pretty high on also were confirmed. We, we'll, we'll get to that. I think pass protection overall is still pretty good. It's um, on the offensive line because obviously that's what I'm paying the closest attention to. Um, and, and, I, and I will say that it, th- it was brought to my attention uh, that there was a thread on the message boards that was uh, none too pleased with our last outing on the Positivity Pod. And what I'll say is it was number one, it was brought to my attention because I don't read the, the boards. Um, sorry to anybody that's ever tried to send me a direct message or communicate with me on the boards. I, I'm not ignoring you. I just don't see it. Um, I take the Tucker Carlson approach to the internet and in that I just don't pay attention to it. And if I could not have a TV in my house, I would take that approach too. Um, so I, I was told that there was a thread where some folks were not happy with things that we had said or whether or the tone that we had taken, um, what I'll say, and not in our defense, but as an explanation is that if EJ and I ever come off as negative Nancy's or we're being overly critical, uh, I should say too, let me caveat overly critical with, we do our best never to name specific players that we might have an issue with because we know what that feels like. And we know that the guys, whether they ignore these, whether they ignore the podcast and they ignore the message boards, you know, they don't ignore Twitter, they don't ignore social media, that stuff gets back to them one way or another. So we do our best not to be over, overly critical of specific players um, because we also understand how um, you can have a bad game one week and have a really, really good game the next week. And, you know, it, I like to believe that the player you see that plays really well, that's who that player really is. And everybody has down weeks. So we do our best not to be overly critical of individual players but if we feel if, if the fans and you know subscribers and folks that listen to this stuff feel like we're being overly critical of the team or of the scheme or of the staff or whatever you know whatever you have or we're not giving folks enough credit um you know for a three and a start it's because ej and i um, and vip also have the three of us have a, a, a personal stake in this you know we see it from a slightly different vantage point and being um being, being hypercritical is the only way that uh, any of us were any good at football. That's the only way that any of us were good enough to make it to the division one level and play division one football. It's just that, 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 that hypersensitivity to mistakes and hypersensitivity um, to, uh, to, to constructive criticism and being constructively critical with ourselves. That's, um, that, that's something that I, I take pride in with myself. And, and, and I often feel that I'm, you know, maybe too hard on myself. I know EJ takes a similar approach and Vip takes a similar approach in his life. And we, we talk about these things off the air. These are conversations that we have with each other. Um, so it's not that we are trying to uh, knock the team down. It's not that we're trying to be overly negative. It's not that we're trying to send a bad message or that we've, you know, thrown in the towel or that we're super down on the team and the program. That's not it at all. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. We have expectations, whether they're realistic or not, <laughs> based on history. Okay. We have expectations as former players that are extremely high, and you know we we have a, a uh, we we are optimistic to the point to where it tears us up when we see things that don't go well. This weekend was a perfect example. We saw things we were concerned with the last few weeks. We've been trying to bring attention to that. Now the tone and the delivery may not have been super positive. It may not have been the way that people wanted the message delivered, but the message we were delivering was unfortunately turned out to be true on some of the bad stuff and on the good stuff it was also true um at least as far as i saw against notre dame which is a from an offensive standpoint that's a very good defense we went up against um so just understand that we look at things differently we have a personal stake in it even something ej and i had a phone call about um last week um you know we we have a 
we have a slightly different perspective on this, on this season, on this team, on this program. And we have certain expectations um, that when they're not met, when the standard that, that we want this program to, to, to reach, to hit, isn't met, it feels very personal to us. And I understand it feels very personal to subscribers and fans because I was a blue blood Carolina fan my whole life growing up and had no skin in the game. Nobody in my family ever went to college. So I was just a Carolina fan because I liked the colors and I liked the school and I lived in North Carolina. I then became a Tar Heel and it's just very personal to me. It's very personal to EJ. It's very personal to Vip. So we will do our best not to be overly critical and to, you know, to be negative Nancy's. This is the positivity pod, which I've always I've always said sarcastically, I think EJ has taken it seriously, um, but we'll continue to provide, you know, the best analysis that we can on the O-line and the D-line. And, you know, with the understanding that, you know, and I think everybody really, everybody should understand this. These are college kids and they're working their butts off and they really are playing as hard as they possibly can. And sometimes it's just not their fault when things don't go properly, but it's our job to dissect it. It's our job to break it down from an expert standpoint, which is, you know, whether we're good experts or bad experts, it's just it's kind of what we are just because we played it. You know, we're not, we're obviously not on, you know, ESPN doing this for a million dollars a year, but, you know, we, we, we do understand um, at a slightly nuanced level. So we're looking at here. So we'll keep trying to break that down for everybody and do it as best we can. And, you know, um, please accept my apologies if tone or delivery was not what people expected or wanted, but, um, you know, three and O at that point was not, um, was not the three and O that, it was three and oh was in there was three wins and no losses. It wasn't three and oh was in we were about to go win a national championship. Yeah. And I think that was our point. And that became very apparent this yeah. past weekend that there's a lot of holes to fill and things to work on. Yeah. Now to get back to Taylor's original question, <laughs> um, it, there were I, I saw I saw good things uh, in pass protection. I saw regression somewhat in the run game. I think we're being a little overly complicated in our RPO and our play action schemes. Uh, we might need to simplify that stuff a little bit. Twist got us. Um, I thought we'd clean that up from last season. Uh, defensive line twist really got the offensive line um, against Notre Dame, particularly in the second half. And then we'll talk about the, you know, the issues that I think we had in the run game and why we just weren't able to run the ball effectively. Um, and EJ, I'm sure we'll have a lot more on the defensive side of the ball, but you know, mm. it, you know, I like to get out of the, out of the problem and into the solution a little bit. And I think to get out of the problem and into the solution on this means look, we got to score 60 points to win games. Okay. We're capable of scoring 60 points every single football game. <laughs> I mean, we just, we are, I mean, off the, our offense sputtered in the first half after that touchdown drive and we still put up 32 points, but then it should have been 35. I mean, Drake may throw us five touchdown passes. That's, that's something. And uh, I think that's, that's something that really should, that deserves a lot of credit and a lot of attention that this team can score at will. I um, mean, even when they have, you know, half a game is not productive. They're still dropping five touchdowns. So that's yeah. that's something we didn't do when I was there. I know that for a fact, and um, it, it, that that is definitely a positive for us. Yeah, after the Georgia State game, we try to make the caveat like this team does. This team did deserve credit for being three and zero. I think from our experiences in the locker room, we know how hard it is to go out there for an entire week of practice, go out in a game against guys that are on scholarship, and come out with a win. Look and at Miami. We, yeah. Miami is the perfect example this week going down to middle Tennessee every week teams that are double digit favorites catch another team or a team that's a double digit favorite gets caught sleeping uh, a team goes into some other place and upsets them North Carolina did deserve a lot of credit for being three and oh but our larger point was if this team continues playing the way they do teams will catch them when the offense has uh, an off day or an off half or the defense continues to play the way the defense continues to play better teams. Once the talent goes up from the, the group of five, the Sunbelt conference teams to a team like Notre Dame, who is a, a top 25 team, regardless of losing to Marshall or however the game, however close the game was against California. Our, our larger point was that, eventually this team was going to um, face a lot of trouble. And you kind of saw that on Saturday against uh, Notre Dame. EJ, what about you? What were your biggest takeaways? Uh, I'm sure you, you have a lot of takeaways because the talk of this team has been the defense. I think what was really taken away from me this game was like my confidence in the defense 
offensive line. If, if it was one thing going, going into this game, if you were to ask me what was one thing that you're absolutely not worried about, no matter what the up, outcome was, I would say that we would at least have have shown that we can play with anybody in the country with our uh, our, our defensive line. Um, I, I kind of saw our guys getting pushed around a little bit. I mean, that kind of goes go, goes for for them just as a collective. I mean, just look at the rushing yard totals. I mean, the, the guys had, had 287 yards rushing and about what 576 total yards that they that they're giving up. I mean, that's uh, that's realistically a game and a half worth, worth of yards. So I mean, I, I, I'm just. I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that I'm down on this defense. It's just that I think I need to lower my expectations and just really kind of accept it for who they are. Just kind of be happy when they go out and, and they they can make a stand. But but at, at the end of the day, it kind of goes back to what Mike said and, and why we are so passionate about this program is because I know like what my defensive line looked like when I was I was able to play with some very talented guys. Our defensive line room looks a lot like that defensive line room looks in Carolina right now, and I think that's why I I, I have put so much pressure on this team and expecting to see so much because I mean, th- those guys can play football. They they can play with anyone else, and I mean I think my my second biggest takeaway is that. I don't know what's going on with the culture of this defense. There's been too many instances where, where teammates are snapping at each other. I mean, you see Noah Taylor come kind of run to the sideline and, and snapping at guys. Um, I think it was, uh, I forget who it was. Tony but, Grimes. Um, he had the, yeah, Tony Grimes had the late hit. I mean, yeah, as a leader, you, you pull that guy to the side, but you don't go chirping at that guy, especially a guy who's from another program, a guy who's kind of a rival program. Like, I mean, yeah, you've been there in a the training camp. You played a couple of games, but still, I mean, that, that that's, I mean, I know like so as close as me and Mike were, if I'd have gotten his face, that would still be an issue like that. Now you say I'm a, a guy that you, you've been playing against that's been on the other side and you transfer in, things like that are going to happen. And I, I think we kind of all as a, as a collective fan base kind of brushed over the moment that happened earlier in the season where the defensive guys were chipping at each other. And I mean, that that's not what you want to see. I mean, that, that, that side of the ball is usually close. I mean, kind of strangely close how, Close. Some of us are are, are still in, in talk now about how we just kind of fed off of each other. So I mean, you you have to be in tune to play defensive football. You have to be able to trust that the guy next to you, the guy lined up behind you, in front of you, that he's going to do what he's supposed to do, so you can do your job the best way. And it just doesn't look like there's a lot of trust amongst these guys. And I mean, I know sometimes you have your wrists, but. Um, as Mike can kind of tell you, and you know as well, that like when things start happening on game day and in front of nationally televised crowds, then things have probably been boiling over for a while. So, yeah, that's that's, 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 the- that's locker room stuff that, that's coming out. And it doesn't mean that they hate each other. It doesn't mean they don't like playing with each other. It means that it's frustration boiling over. Mm-hmm. And frustration usually has a lot of sources. Um, so, again, like this is, you know, to go back to, you know, what we were talking about at the top of this pod here, like, it, EJ knows what he's talking about. This isn't like, he's not calling out certain players. He's not being overly negative and overly critical here. He knows exactly what he's talking about because he lived it and he did it. Um, the, the other thing too, and I think, you know, EJ, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the extra point of this is, you know, they're, they're chirping at each other. There seems like the, maybe there's a, when we say culture problem, mm-hmm. like there just seems like there's a disconnect from a, uh, either a personality standpoint um, or just a relational standpoint between the mm-hmm. guys right exactly. now. That doesn't mean that it's not fixable. It doesn't mean that they don't like each other and they don't all get along. It means in this game, something happened. There was stuff that had been boiling over previously, maybe from previous Mm -hmm. games. You know, and listen, I can tell you from firsthand experience that, you know, when you're hearing from the outside, you know, that you're not holding your weight. You know, we even heard this internally a little bit. You know, we were not, the offense wasn't carrying our weight, you know, when we played, when when you and I were playing. And, and, And let's be completely honest here. That was a top 10 defense we were put on the field every year and it, we had games where we looked really good tj's thrown for 300 plus 400 plus yards and a bunch of touchdowns and we had other games where we needed the defense to score two touchdowns for us to win the game and have four turnovers like there were times where we just as an offense we felt that pressure and that that's very frustrating because it's a pride thing so for us it's not necessarily that you know we're fighting with each other that we don't like each other if you see guys button heads on the sidelines it's because there are outside frustrations that are building and building and building. You're hearing chatter and you have, there's a pride thing. If you don't feel like your teammates think that as a unit, you're carrying your weight. If you don't feel like the fan base or the coaching staff or whatever, if you feel like you're playing second fiddle to the other side of the ball, I mean, yeah, that, that creates a complex. It just, it does. Um, and that, that creates confidence issues and creates frustration issues. It all sort of builds and bubbles over and, and eventually, you know, can, can result in some chirping on the sidelines and things, but it doesn't mean, that that's that next week that's still going to be the same problem. It doesn't mean that today in film it's the same problem. 
Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, don't think when EJ says, you know, there's a culture issue on the defense that, you know, it's throwing the towel on the defense. They're done. Let's just hope that we can score 75 points a game and, and you know, boat race teams and win. That's not what mm-hmm. he's saying. What he's saying is there's clearly some stuff that's, that's been building for a while. And I'm, I'm hoping, and I know you are, that they've gotten this out of their system now and we can start building. You know, Gene Chizik's defense several years ago, VIP, I mean, when you guys went played in the ACC championship game, like there were def- those defenses leading up to that 2015 team weren't great. Okay. But they eventually built themselves into something. I think I even saw this in the 2015 season where that defense built itself into a bend don't break yeah. kind of defense under Chizik. So listen, we're four games in and we told you that because you're playing some, you know, not lesser competition, because again, middle Tennessee state versus Miami, it's not like we went out, we played Furman three times. Okay. No offense to Furman really. I mean, sisters that. of the blind. Yeah, we weren't playing. Yeah, we weren't playing Mother Mary Sisters <laughs> that's Coach of the Blind Br- out there. Yeah, that's Coach yeah. Brewer's number one reference. Yeah, sisters yeah, of yeah. the Blind. Mother Mary Sisters of the Blind. <laughs> um, we weren't out there playing them three times. You know, we beat three good teams, good football teams, especially in App State. You know, Georgia State's a much better team than they've been in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, and those are those are mid-major teams. Um, they're Division One A or you know FBS football teams. So you know. We, we talked about there might be a lag in development. There might be a lag in sort of that at the point that you know what team you have, it might be an extra week or two into this season, whereas normally you'd know about week three, week four. It might be week five or six before we really know what this team is. Um, you know, the defense has put things on tape that are pretty good. Mm-hmm. They put some stuff on tape that's pretty bad. We have some great athletes on that defensive unit, and, and I think that's why – that's really a lot where, where, where the frustration comes from, and I think – Definitely for me, because I mean, over the past few years, what we've been talking about, we've been talking about talent and depth on that defensive unit. Well, that's what I really feel like that we have now. I feel like we can go too deep at almost every position on the defense in a defensive unit. And we're not talking about a lot of young guys. So, I mean, yeah, there's a new system and everything, but, and, that, that, and that's what I mean. Just, just kind of going back to your point, like the culture of a defense is knowing how to communicate with each other. It just seems like these guys don't know how to communicate with each other. When, when chips are, when, when, when things are going well, they're out there, they're chest bumping, but when things go bad or things aren't going well, they start chipping at each other. And that's, that, that's really just a mindset change. Like you say, it can get better. It's more so saying that, hey, we need to learn how to how, how to just, okay, we're frustrated right now, learn how to put that moment behind us and still communicate with each other because we're going we're gonna to need each other for the rest of this game and the rest of this season. So, but and, I, maybe I, a, and maybe a game like Notre Dame is what does it for them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, EJ, you hit on the, the low moment of the game for me with that Carolina defense. It was Tony Grimes picking up the – um, late hit out of bounds penalty. Noah Taylor kind of gets in his face, basically just telling him we can't be having these kind of mistakes in these kind of moments. Grimes takes a jab at his own teammate. And it that was kind of the moment. Like I was already feeling really down about this Carolina defense. But when I saw that, that's kind of like where where you mentioned like all hope that I had for the defense, however slim it was, that they could make a turnaround, it, it kind of went away for me when I saw that moment because that group at that moment looked so disjointed. And I kind of compare it to the the 2015 team that I played on for Carolina, where if if somebody like Landon Turner is getting in my face or somebody like Jeff Shotmer, Shaquille Rashad, Mac Hollins, Quinshaw Davis, if one of those guys is getting in my face, I know that they have a pretty good reason to be getting in my face and that it's probably me that is not holding up my end of the bargain and not playing to the standard that we kind of talk about. Like, you know, every Carolina team, we want to be ACC champions. We want to be uh, one of the goals is always win the last game of the season. So if one of the leaders on your team, which Noah Taylor, even though he comes from Virginia, Noah Taylor is one of the leaders on this Carolina team by all accounts. I think you have to have the awareness there where if somebody is getting in your face, there's no malicious intent or they're not trying to get under your skin or they're not like picking on you or, or anything kind of like that. And that was the moment for me where it kind of, it it was, it just, I disheartening is really the only word I guess you could use because I think we all had really high hopes when coach Chizik comes in and, they have been stacking a lot of talent with 
I think four straight top 25 recruiting classes. Mm -hmm. So to see a moment like that, um, that was, that was for me, you know, you, you could give up as many yards, you could give up as, as many touchdowns to see the guys kind of like that. And like you mentioned, Mike, it's, it's frustration boiling over from the team, not being where, where they probably thought they were. Um, But EJ, it's some of that too. If it, sorry, did I don't mean to cut you off that? But some of that too. There's a broader. There's a broader developmental thing that goes along with that, and I didn't understand that I was going through this at the time until many years after I was done um, out of college. But there's when you see things like that, when you see chirping between the players, and you see, um, you know, things boil over like we saw with Tony Grimes. You know, these are these are young men growing into men literally in the moment and moment by moment and learning how to deal with certain circumstances, uh, disappointment after high expectations, um, disappointment, you know, high expectations as a unit. You know, I'm associated with a unit that's supposed to be really good. I'm supposed to be a player who's supposed to be playing very good and I'm, and I'm not playing up to my own personal standards. I don't know. Oh. A player whether, who is supposed to go to the NFL. Too. Yes, and, and who he personally expects to go to the NFL, right? And maybe Tony feels like, and I, I haven't watched you know, enough film on Tony to know this. I don't know what the eye in the sky is saying on Tony, but maybe Tony feels you know, on one play or on a series of plays or overall he's not performing in the way that he expects himself to perform. Maybe other guys feel that way about themselves. And you're learning how to deal, as a man, you're learning how to deal with these things in real time. And unfortunately, now that everything is, every game is televised and not just certain games, but every single game is televised on national TV. Um, we see that stuff. You know, we see that growing up in real time. And they're learning, you know, you, you don't realize that, that you're, you're growing as a young man in the middle of these football games. I can think back to specific lessons I learned from specific plays in, in specific games. Now, as you know, at 34 years old, when I was 20 and 21 playing in games at Carolina, I can think back to the play that taught me a lesson that I now use in my personal life or the issue I had in the locker room that taught me how to deal with a specific type of personality, right? With other folks I meet now out on the street. Um, you don't realize at all, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on, man. Like you're still your brain is still forming. Like your frontal lobe isn't fully developed at this point. Like things are still like you're growing as a, you're growing as a human being and you're growing as a man and you're learning how to handle yourself in a, in a multitude of situations and football, a football game, but a football locker room really puts a lot of, it takes, it takes all those big pressure situations and it puts them into little three and four second increments that you have to deal with and adapt to and process all right now. And sometimes you just don't do that the right way. But I, I can guarantee you that some of that stuff that we saw, some of the, like we've talked about chirping on the sidelines and issues that we're seeing maybe between guys on a personal level um, to the extent that actually exists in the locker room, that stuff's getting sorted out now. And it's, it's, it's working itself out. Um, it may not be comfortable for us to watch, but I promise it's working itself out and we'll have positive effects down the road. Yeah. And EJ, a week after. Positivity pod, baby. Yeah. <laughs> a week after throwing for a pedestrian 150 yards in his first ever start, Drew Pine, he comes down to Chapel Hill. He eclipses that 150 yards mark by halftime. He finishes with, 289 yards, three touchdowns, and no turnovers. It's another week and another career-high performance for the defense. We've been doing this podcast for I don't know how many years now, and I don't know how many games we've talked about on Monday where the other quarterback has a career high. It's something that – it's a stigma that this program cannot shake at this point where mm – -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're a first-year quarterback or a fourth-year starting quarterback. You circle the North Carolina game on your schedule because of the defense, and you know you're going to have a chance to really shine. What did you kind of see from Drew Pine and the approach that Carolina took against him? I, I, I don't really know, man, but all I know is it. I, I don't know what the, the approach and the mindset was. 
I know that they were trying to pressure him a little bit more, but I mean, our, our pass rush just isn't there enough to make quarterbacks uncomfortable. We're, we're not. And, and that's why no matter a lot of these quarterbacks that are coming in, if they're studying their game plan, if they know where their reads are, most of the time they're getting through their first, second, third reads. I mean, we, I saw a couple of plays where we're getting first downs where the the third guy in trips, we're playing 11 yards off of them. Like you can't stop anybody. Like you're not going to stop anybody if they know they can guarantee they're guaranteed to get seven plays again, seven yards a, a, a game. And, and also, I mean, I, I will give credit where credit's due. I mean, the, the mayor kid really looks like he's going to be another great tight end from Notre Dame. I mean, the kid had an impressive game. A lot of the times we were there and he was just making great catches. I mean, he's a strong kid. So I think a lot of that credit goes to him. I mean, he had 88 of those yards, uh, yeah. seven catches. So, I mean, he, he had a really good game. And I mean, our guys were, were with him. They were in coverage. But I mean, sometimes you just play against guys who who just have it. I mean, I mean, you, you wouldn't expect guys to go out there and stop Gronk. Not, not comparing this guy to Gronk. His but nickname he, is Baby Gronk. I mean, he, he. I mean, he wears. He looks like it out there. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. he, he, he did his best Gronk impression yesterday, and and I, and I think a lot of that. I mean, I'm not going to discredit our defense. I mean, that's a talented kid. I mean, he's, he's at Notre Dame, and we all know that through our recruiting processes and playing against them, Notre Dame usually gets guys with four and five stars beside their name in the recruiting process. So this kid deserves to be there just like everyone else. So I, I definitely I will attribute it to that. Some and, and again, the rest of it really is to the pass rush or, or the lack thereof. I mean, the the guys, uh, Akimon Rucker and some of those other guys who we've been kind of looking to to get this pressure. I mean, we, we need it from everyone else. This has to be a collective thing because – I mean, if it's not a collective thing, guys like this, they're going to find a way to pick up the blitzes, pick up the pressures. He's going to throw all day. And if we're playing against a running quarterback, if we get out of our lanes, he's just going to have a career rushing day on us. So, I mean, just that lack of that, that lack of pass rush is really going to hurt us in so many different ways that if you're just watching a game and saying, oh, we're not getting sacks. No, that's just not the thing. You can not get a sack all game and not and have a quarterback not be comfortable. If, if he's throwing that ball away or, if it, or other things happening, they're checking into other players plays then the pass rush is really doing that i mean it 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 it, it gets to a certain level of intimidation and mike can tell you this if you have a guy that's beating you all day on pass rush your 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 stance is going to be a little bit differently Mm -hmm. the offensive line is going to start setting a little bit differently and it's going to completely mess up the flow of the offense so i mean it it has ramifications not just on third down and long it it, it really affects the offense's whole game plan because you're not going to keep dropping your guy back and he's going to get hurt now that we know that they have to run the ball when they're passing they're going to be an obvious pass pass formations when they're running they're going to be an obvious run formations because they're going to have to get the blockers in so i mean it's it's just a lot of things that kind of feed off that and we're not really getting that right now and once again this kind of leads to more frustration because i mean if you look at that roster i mean we we, we have the guys we have the talent we, we have the the people that can do that i mean i, I just i i don't have as much confidence in the back end but i think having more pass rush will help those guys out too because they know they won't have to cover for as long so i mean it, it just really has so many different effects and ripple effects throughout the team i mean if you're pass rushing well i mean i mean i'll, I'll tell you this a personal experience it makes it a lot easier to play the run on the way to the quarterback when, when you're already getting off um as one of my old coaches used to say high booty spatting and you're you're knocking those guys back so i mean it's that's just something that's been missing for for a long time from this program. And I mean, hats off to their tight end who had a great day. I mean, hats off to him for having another career day. I mean, I, I can't, that's one thing that I will say that I'm guilty of. Uh, Pat White did have a career day against us. So maybe the curse started longer uh, ago than we thought it did. <laughs> yeah, I, I still have nightmares about Baylor in the bowl game. Yeah. Knowing that they didn't have a quarterback and <laughs> just being able to gash us and overmatch our defensive line time after time, but I was looking at the pro football focus grades and I normally take a lot of stock into them, but without knowing the call, I don't know how they graded this UNC Notre Dame game because it's hard to even assess who was at fault a lot of times for this North Carolina defense with how far away they were from some of Notre Dame's receiving options. Like a lot of those guys, you know, you guys as linemen, we could, we could put you out there on routes on, on some of those wheel routes and you're catching and, and walking into the end zone with how open some of those guys were. And that, that was another frustrating thing with the defense where um, it, it, it's one thing if Notre Dame is just outmanning you and just running it up, um, which, which they were doing for a good portion of the game. But it's it's the times where it's like, what is the game plan? It's 
like the I can make peace with the Baylor game because we knew what their game plan was mm-hmm. and we tried to match up with them. We just didn't have the bodies to match up with them. But it wasn't a case of this receiver is going to run a wheel three straight three straight plays banking on one time the defense kind of forgetting whose responsibility it was and that was another problem I I saw for the Carolina defense and a a stat that kind of puts this into perspective for for the defense right now Carolina is the 126th total defense in the country this is out of 131 teams they're giving up 495.2 495.2 yards per game. It's the second worst in the Power Five. Only Nebraska's worse. And who's, who's beneath us? Who are the five teams beneath us? It's Nebraska, Bowling Green, FIU, Ohio, and Charlotte. Um, so ne- Nebraska is really the only comparable. State of North Carolina is representing that bottom, that yeah. bottom ten, uh, ten defense. Yeah, and it, it's never. Right now in 2022, it's never good to be in the same conversation as Nebraska. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Not at all, man. <laughs> yeah, this was 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's, 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 years ago and you're comparing yourself to Nebraska, you're like, oh, wow, I might be in the, the national title conversation. But mm-hmm. now it's, it's Scott Frost getting fired after losing to, um, who was it, Georgia Southern from – the Sun Belt Conference. Um, but Mike, you mentioned earlier the the run game for North Carolina and how Notre Dame did a pretty good job bottling them up. The highest run blocking grade, according to pro football focus, among Carolina's offensive line, all offensive linemen played um, every snap. So it's easy to tell who was out there. Um, but the highest run block grade was 60.4. So not, not too good. Carolina rushed for only 2.4 yards per carry. What did you see there, and why was Notre Dame able to kind of control the point of attack? Um, that was it. They controlled the point of attack. We didn't get enough movement on the first level, and because of that, they had linebacker run-throughs, and we weren't getting to our second-level assignments, you know, uh, ho-hum, you know, things, points I've made before. Uh, but that's you, – you see a game like Notre Dame is why it's so important to get first-level movement because – those linebackers, Notre Dame's linebackers were hitting gaps. When they saw pullers leave, they were hitting gaps. When they saw double teams get set up, they started hitting, they started shooting gaps. They understood where they were supposed to be. And that's because they're a very talented, very well coached defense. Uh, but they understood where they were supposed to be. You can, and they exploited that. You can solve a lot of those problems by getting first level movement and just creating a mush there at the second level. And eventually you got, you know, you have a guy like, you know, a Marion that can, that, that can make you right. Um, you can have a Petaway that can make you right. You, you can have DJ Jones can make you right. You know, guys that are talented with the ball in their hands. So if you can just create sort of a cluster and a mess there on the second level enough, you don't even have to necessarily get off on your assignment. Obviously the dream is to take, if you're running a double team, whether it's a zone or a gap scheme, take that double team straight to your linebacker, your second level assignment, and literally put that dude on skates and run that defensive lineman's butt straight into that linebacker and just create a, 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 a wall that way. That's clinic tape. That doesn't happen really ever. I mean, once in a while it does, but it's very rare for that to happen. What, re- what, what normally happens is you get enough movement, you know, two, three, maybe a fourth step or a third and a half step on that defensive lineman pushed back. Okay. To where he's stalemating you by the end of that rep, you're stalemating him by the end of that rep, but you've moved him far enough back that you're now right in that linebacker's face. And that linebacker can't see clearly where the ball carry is and you fall forward for an extra yard or two. And every, every once in a while, that extra yard or two falling forward goes for a first down or it, like we saw against App State, it can break for a 50 some odd yard touchdown. Um, so that's the thing that I didn't think we did a great job of in the run game was getting uh, enough first level movement to create problems at the second level. You don't always have to get off on your second level assignment. You don't always have to, you know, every rep doesn't have to be clinic tape. Sometimes you can get just enough movement on that defensive lineman to, uh, to, to create some, some issues at the second level, whether it's vision issues or spacing issues for those linebackers. And even though you don't get your hands on, and even though you don't actually lock up for that second level assignment, you don't get your hands on their breastplate, you don't make contact, you've created enough mess in front of them that you've altered 
either their pursuit angle. Um, you've made them cha- you've made them change what they plan to do in terms of hitting a gap um, or where they expected the ball to be, or you just created enough um, vision, uh, uh, enough trash in his vision to where he couldn't see where the ball was for a split second, and it got you an extra yard or two. Sometimes that's just enough. If we can if we can get more of that first level movement, um, which I saw early in the season um, against you know those Sun Belt teams and against FAMU, I saw that. Um, working pretty well. If we can do that moving forward through the ACC schedule, we'll be okay. I think Notre Dame was a, was a big test because that's a big, strong athletic defensive line with really fast, smart linebackers. Um, but if we can learn from this tape and understand that we don't have to, everything doesn't have to be clinic take on, clinic tape on every rep, that we just got to get some more movement on the first level, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. Even with all that being said and where this, we've talked about it before that this offense is kind of be going to be handicapped with how well the offensive line does it it almost feels irrelevant to talk about the offense because the standard on that side of the ball can't be perfection it can't be they need to score on every possession it can't be the 50 plus points it's the same way we talk about uh, quarterbacks having career days it feels like we've talked about a bunch of times that the standard for this offense can't be they need to score 50 plus points to win because you know well it forces us to sit here and nitpick things which is i mean which is the point of this podcast right it's to nitpick certain things from a technique standpoint that's what ej and i and you do but you know that's we shouldn't have to sit here and and say that the offense was unsuccessful scoring five touchdowns and dropping what there should have been 35 points yeah right because we're sitting here nitpicking that you know we got one yard of push on the offensive line in the run game in the second half instead of three yards of push and we weren't able to you know snap off you know too many first downs in the run game like we shouldn't have to sit here and do that and kind of expanding on on the offense you you do a great job covering the the line play i saw some people questioning what uh antoine green's role would be when when he came back and, and he answered that he he's a starter. He is one of the best receivers on this Carolina team. He I think, is real boomer bust too. Cause he, yeah. Antoine green, every game is good for like, how'd he drop that ball? Yeah. And also how'd he catch that ball and run that fast, run that far. Like yeah. every single game he's in, he's just a boomer bust guy. Like, and you know, you're going to get it from him. He's going to, yeah. you're going to pull his hair out once you're going to pull your hair out once or twice watching him play. Um, but then you're going to be jumping up and down screaming for joy. Another time. It's like every single time he's out there, he's, he's like a cardiac kid. Yeah. He had a drop, but the way he gets behind defenses and stretches them vertically, it was like a a welcome back moment for Josh Downs and Antoine green, where they come back, they combine for 182 yards and, and four touchdowns. Um, the young receivers did a good job in, in those two's absence. But when, when that team is fully healthy, I don't think there's any question that it's, it's Josh Downs and Antoine Green. You'd like to see somebody like Kobe Pesor more involved where it was kind of like Josh Downs his freshman year where you know you have this talented guy on the bench and he's just waiting for his opportunity. And when Kobe Pesor's opportunity came, he did take advantage of it. He was Carolina's best receiver in the App State game and the Georgia State game. Um, so I think moving forward, I'd, I'd like to see Carolina get a little more creative, getting him on the field and kind of not platooning him and Josh Downs because Josh Downs is so good, but finding more ways to kind of get Kobe Pace or involved with the offense. Um, well, you know, one way I think we can do that and it is I, I don't know that we need to be married to this use the run to set up the pass philosophy. If that's, if that's what Phil Longo's doing, I'm not in Phil Longo's head, but from what I can see, it looks like we're, we're that traditional, like we want to use the run to set up the explosive pass game. I think we can be the opposite. You know, I mean, we can use the pass game to set up the run. So we saw some issues with the run game against Notre Dame, but our pass game looked pretty good and our pass protection on the whole looked good. There were some issues that I pointed out and we can talk about that in terms of twists and stuff, but um, in term, in, as far as protection is concerned, but I think we can use the pass to set up the run. It works the same way. It's just in the inverse, right? I mean, everybody, you know, old football heads, you know, we like to think like use the run, use the run, use the run, and then you pop off a big pass. Well, you can do the same thing. You can stretch a defense in the pass, right? Stretch them, stretch them, stretch them, and then hand it off on a draw or hand it off on a power and you gash them for 10 or 12 yards in the run. And sometimes that's all you need to then set up the next explosive play. So I think we can, you know, set up opportunities for a guy like Pace or by, 
by becoming super, you know, real pass happy and the run becomes a complement to the pass game. Um, I think we can, I think we can do it that way. And again, I'm not in Phil Longo's head, but from what I can tell, I think we're trying really hard to be balanced and, you know, the priority is setting up the run in order to benefit the pass game as opposed to the, to the opposite. Maybe that's, maybe that's the way to go. Yeah. And EJ, I know a lot of the fan base is feeling pretty hopeless waking up on Monday when it comes to the defense. You can pick any stat to choose from the defensive performance. Um, a few of them I have is that this is the third straight game that Car the Carolina defense had given up 10 first downs in a single quarter. Um, the Irish scored on six straight possessions. They rushed for, let me see, where's the rushing? They rushed for 5.6 yards per carry. The quarterback has a, a career high game. Looking at it glass half full. I want you to try to look at it glass half full. <laughs> I know it's tough. a lot, man. <laughs> I know it's tough to do after I listed out all those stats. Looking at glass half full, where can this defense improve? Because a lot of people like myself are looking at this and saying, I don't know how you fix this in season. Like we're, we're getting paid to analyze this team, but I don't know how you fix this. Like what's the one good thing you're seeing that they can build on to maybe yeah. break open some other stuff. They came on Rucker. They, 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 they on Rucker's they, bull they, rush. They, they, they swarm to the ball. I will say this, that, 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 that I will never. And, and I don't see myself coming on this podcast, talking about a lack of effort from our team. That was, that was three or four years ago when what we didn't know was that that was a team that was really kind of frustrated with their head coach and not really motivated to play for him. So um, I, I think that swarming to the ball, I think that our depth, I, I think those are two things that we can be in, in, encouraged about. And I do think that there's the, 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 another thing that's so frustration. Maybe we should call this the frustration pod and not the positivity pod. Something else that I'm kind of, this is the therapeutic about, pod for me. It, it is a therapeutic yeah, pot. Yeah. If we, if if we, if I discipline and 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 taking ownership of their assignments, if those guys could just do that with the athleticism that they have, yeah, we're still going to get beat on some plays. But I think overall, that is the quickest way for us to make an improvement. One, we have to, we, we have to improve on that. But I think once we, as a as a whole, as a unit, once they take ownership of eye discipline, of, of reading your keys, of knowing what you saw in practice and, and hopefully in film study all week, is, is to, to be true, keep your eyes on your luggage. Just keep your eyes on your luggage. Do what you've been coached to do. Do what falls within the game plan. That way, the coach knows when to adjust. If you're going out there and you're not doing something and you're coming back and telling the coach a different thing, he's not really going to see the big picture until probably – of, uh, when he goes back to watch the whole game film. So I just just do what you're what you're coached to do. Do what the 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 call the play calls for. And I think that you'll see a vast improvement because then these guys can let their athleticism go to work. I still think we have the two most athletic linebackers in the ACC, maybe two of the most athletic in the country. We've been saying that for years though, haven't we? So, I mean, it's, it's time for some of this athleticism to, to, to turn into production on the field. Yeah. The, the problem with the Carolina defense at this point is we're not asking them to be a top 25 unit. That, that's kind of gone out the window. We're just asking them to not be the 126th unit in the country, which doesn't feel like that crazy of an ask when they have had four straight top 25 recruiting classes. And the, the initial message from Mac Brown when he got here was that he wants North Carolina to play for national championships. And when the team went to the Orange Bowl behind guys like Chas Rad and Michael Carter and Javante Williams and Sam Howell, it really did feel like they were progressing towards that goal. Of I felt like we were ahead of schedules. But yeah. It felt like. mm -hmm. yeah. It felt like and this. I, I'm, I'm trying not to get, I'm trying not to say it was a fluke year. Yeah. All right. I think maybe there's just maybe some pieces left and we yeah. just, we, we're still trying to fill those, those gaps. I don't know, but I, I'm, I'm not on the it was a fluke year thing yet, but we definitely felt like we were ahead of schedule in that Orange Bowl year. Yeah, and the, the public perception from this program used to be, or I guess it, it still is in some sense, that Mac Brown is saying that 
the goal is to play for national championships, but you know, the, the further we get away from that orange ball appearance, it seems like the further we're getting away from them being uh, a national title contender. And it, it's tough to watch for, for like people who care about the program, which I know a ton of people do that played for Carolina and a ton of people that are on inside Carolina's premium message boards. And a lot of people that are listening to this podcast, like Carolina basketball fans outnumber Carolina football fans by like a, a hundred to one ratio, but the people that care about Carolina football care, care, care. they care. It's, it's passionate. It's why inside Carolina is the number one site on 24 seven. And it's constantly the most visited site. And it's, it's tough to watch Mac Brown's press conferences right now because it seems like there is a, a huge disconnect from reality to come out in the post game and say things like, he's proud the guys didn't quit or that Notre Dame looks like they're a top 10 team. Like we didn't just watch them play Marshall and struggle against Marshall and struggle against Cal. How much of the problem with this team, Mike, do you think is that Mac Brown seemingly won't admit that there is a problem and whatever he, I think, I think he is drastically a different person behind closed doors when he's talking to his staff than how he fact that he is than how he appears to the media. (laughs) But how much of the problem with the fan base do you think there is that after a game like that, he he it's almost like he he can't admit his own team's shortcomings. Um, I think Mac has been doing this long enough that he knows not to beat up his team publicly. Um that the opportunity presents itself to put a, put a brave face on and to try and put a positive spin on something publicly, he's going to do it because they're about to get tore up in film today. I'm sure they got tore up in film on offense and defense. Again, offense scored 35 points. They had two quarters in that game where they didn't look great. I mean, they were three and out most of the time and to be very fair to the defense, it's not easy on the defense when you've got the offense going three and out. So defense is getting some stops. Offense comes out, goes three and out. The next drive, Notre Dame scores. Like it's just that's how that that doesn't help out our defense at all when we're not moving the ball and we're not scoring points. Now, to your point, we don't need to be perfect every single drive. We sh- we don't need to we shouldn't have to score ten touchdowns in a game to win a game. Uh, but the timing of three and outs and and even just moving the ball and getting the defense a, an eight or nine play break, that stuff matters. Um, that that helps defensive performance too. So we can't have situations on offense like we had where we're going three and out, three and out, three and out, kind of getting stifled on offense and the defense is having to roll back out there tired and beat up and, you know, maybe their confidence is down. That's not helping, but Mac knows that he's been doing this long enough that he knows like I'm about to tear these guys up in film on Sunday. I'm about to tear this coaching staff up in private meetings. I'm not going to beat them up in the, in, in the, in the media right after the game. Okay. Those guys internally, they know Mac's messaging internally they know what they got to fix they're being told what they got to fix you know that i know that ej knows that so publicly it doesn't help anybody and it only makes the problem worse to the you know whatever the problem is which we don't know what the problem is um it only makes the problem worse when you're out throwing your team under the bus now some some folks see guys like jimbo fisher nick saban i mean they get like real fiery well you know they they can do that. If they want to throw their guys under the bus publicly, you know, after a bad game, they can do that. They're also winning 10 and 11 games a year. Okay. But when you've got a team that you're trying to build an identity when you're trying to build confidence with, there's a lot of new pieces on this team, including the quarterback. We look at Drake May and he throws, you know, for ungodly stats, every single, every single time he's out there, this kid started four games. Like he's a baby. Like we forget, you know, we've been seeing this kid. We think this is like this long sustained success and we're coming off of Sam Howell with long sustained success. We forget that he's, he's still new. He's a new piece. Yeah. So even the most critical player on the field is a new guy. So Max building a team, he's building a rapport. He's building confidence. He's building a locker room. He's still building a program. Um, so it doesn't do any good to throw them under the bus publicly. That's not, that's not what's going to get them to where they want to be. Yeah. We've gotten about 50 minutes into this podcast and we haven't really even mentioned that, Drake May threw for over 300 yards, five touchdowns, no interceptions. He had the one fumble, if you're really nitpicking, kind of giving Notre Dame a short field to work with. A lot of that was late, too. It was the first yeah. drive, and then it was late in the game. Yeah, and his quarterback rating, 183.7. Uh, Drew Pine, who had a career day, 
his quarterback rating was was still below Drake Mays. Uh, so it's it's kind of easy to take for granted what Drake May is doing against a team like Notre Dame in only his fourth start where you, you watch Drake May and the potential oozes off the field. He looks every bit the part of, of somebody who's going to be a high draft pick in the in the coming years for Carolina. That's but, what we do, man. Our defense gets quarterbacks drafted because the opposing quarterbacks are going to have career days. And then our quarterbacks have to throw for so many yards and touchdowns. They're, they're also going to get drafted. Yeah. Think yeah. about it. Well, well, let's let's, let that let's also make this point, okay? Obligatory. Why are these not our permanent uniforms? Yeah. yeah. No, Why are these not the permanent uniforms? No argument from me. I really don't know where any of that pushback is really even coming from. I, I keep shouting from the top of my mountain, make these the permanent uniforms. And every person I shout it to, they're like, I agree with you. <laughs> so I keep I don't shouting. Know what we're maybe we love about. them. Maybe, maybe we love them so much because we're only getting them in doses. Maybe that's why we love them so much. So it's actually the plan's working. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm a man, fan of nice. I'm a Except fan for Drake May's quarterback sleeves. They, they got to break that up with yeah. some Carolina blue. God, that was bad. Yeah, That can't be all Navy all the way down there. But everybody else, that looks – Nike will fix that. They got to get a new one in. J-Bone, if you're listening, call Nike. Yeah, I, uh, I'm – Fix the quarterback sleeve. But every I, those those uniforms are, are sick nasty. I'm such a fan of Carolina's normal uniforms, but – Yeah, they are. And then we do have some of the Christmas uniforms generally. Already have the best uniforms, the best unique color combination in the country, but the retro uniforms take it up a notch. It looks classic. It looks timeless. Um, it looks unbelievably clean in primetime games. Mm-hmm. So we're just going to keep yelling. We're just going to yeah. keep yelling, make them the permanent uniform. Nobody's really pushing back against us, but we're also not getting any answers really on why this isn't the, the permanent. We're not getting uniform. any answers. And we just found out that Sway had the answer, so somebody has to have the answer, right? <laughs> but, guys, always great talking to you. Carolina, back in action this Saturday, October 1st. It's a 3.30 game on the ACC Network. It's the pesky Virginia Tech Hokies, always, always tough. Um, But they're getting them away from Lane Stadium, Virginia Tech at North Carolina, Keenan Stadium, 3.30 p.m., ACC Network. Always a pleasure talking with you guys and appreciate everybody who listens or watches. And we will talk to you guys next week. 